Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. My name is Eke Maus from Pixel Train. This here is the fifth lesson of our series Fusion for Production, the VFX compositing workflow for Fusion. And I know it's been a while since we had our last lesson, so I took a break and I produced a Blender Fundamentals training with over 20 hours of content, so I needed a little bit of time in producing. But now it's released, so if you're interested in also learning Blender Fundamentals, you find a trailer here on my YouTube. But now we are back with these free tutorial series, and I hope you are now also back in learning Fusion. So let's get started. We are learning basic fundamental concepts about Fusion and how the tools work. And in the first lessons, we talked first about the software package and the differences between Fusion Studio and Fusion inside of DaVinci Resolve. Then we talked about the merge node and also the deep pixel workflow. And this time we want to talk about masks and the masking workflow. Because masks are really important if you want to do VFX work, right? So masks are used for rotoscoping. You limit effects of tools and effects. And what you also can do, and this is a really strong part of Fusion, is you can make motion graphics inside of Fusion. And masks are used for that because they are vector based. You can do fake UIs, hearts, transitions, and many other things here. There are also some differences between the mask workflow in Fusion in comparison to, for example, After Effects or Nuke. So I hope this video helps you. So let's get started directly here in a new project. So what I do here is I take a photo like this here and we want to try some mask tools here. And what I do is I switch directly over to the Fusion page without making a timeline. I go to the media pool and this time, let's go here to the master, I generate directly a new Fusion composition. And let's name it masks so that we know what we are doing. It's 5 seconds and 25 frames. So we have to double click it because we don't have a timeline and it's not a timeline effect now. So if this concept is new for you, then please refer to the lesson where we talked about the Fusion integration inside of Resolve. So the only thing we get now is a media out. And you don't need to use the media out if you don't want, because you can directly make a saver node and a loader node. Same thing like in uh, Fusion Studio. The next thing we need is our media. So let's go here to the media pool and bring this image in and if you hook it now up you see directly here our image and the image itself is 4k around and this is important a little bit later when we talk about masks and resolutions so keep that in mind this is around a 4k image okay let's now start with masking the first thing we want to do now here with the help of the mask is we want to talk about how masks are used inside of the node flow and we have here in the toolbar four masking tools. We have a rectangular and ellipse mask. We have a polygon or a bezier mask. Sometimes it's referred like this. And we have a B-spline mask. There are also some more masks here. So if you go here to the effects and go here into the tools masks, you see we have a lot more of these masks. And we will talk about all these masks in a minute. And if you want now to test this mask, we can take an effect. Let's say we want to make a vignette, for example, for this. So let's take a tool like this here, a brightness and contrast, and flick it in. We gain it down. Okay, now this image is dark. And a vignette means that we only have the darkened areas here in the outer areas of the image. So we want to limit that. And for this, we can now use an ellipse mask. You see that many tools have these blue inputs. And the blue input is, if you hover with your mouse over that, you see it in the status bar and also in this little help here. This is the effect mask, which means this input is used for limiting the effect. And to now hook a mask up, there are different ways. You can select the node here and directly click off one of these masking tools. And you will see that instantly you get a connection here. So Fusion is really clever it knows where to put a mask. Same thing, by the way, is if you go here to the effects and click here. So if this here is selected and you say, I want to have a lips mask, you see it works the same here. Or what you also can do, like always, shift spacebar, search for the thing you are after, for example, ellipse, enter key, 
and then you can hook it up by hand. And here we come to a really interesting concept. You remember that this data stream here is 4K. So if you go here with your mouse over this node, you get a little helper here. You see the frame size of 4K. If you click here and add a mask here, the mask itself has a size and we can see that. Let's open a second viewer, drop the mask in and zoom a little bit out and you see, okay, this mask here has now the same plate size as this data stream here because we have selected this node before. Let's kill this mask here and deactivate everything. And now we drag a new ellipse mask into the flow and drag it here into this window. And now you see, interesting, this time the mask is only HD. Why? Because my project, which I'm working in, inside of my Resolve is an HD project. And every generator node takes the resolution here by default of my project. And that's the difference. And in other applications, this can be now a problem because the mask here is much smaller than the area which you want to use it, right? But now comes the interesting thing. If you now take the mask here and look here into, for example, the position or the width and height, you don't see pixel amounts here. You see 0 0.5, which means the center is in the middle. And the width is also 0 0.5. So it uses half of the plate size. And normally I refer to this for my trainees like a percentage. The masks are stored in a percentage way, which makes you really flexible later. So if you now hook this up here, you will see that here the circle is sitting here in the center. So it's not a big problem if you don't have here the right size at the beginning because here it gets it correctly. But if you want ever to change the size of a mask, you can select it here and you find here under the image tab, the output size of this. And here you see it, you can go to custom and then you see here, here's a width and a height in pixel, which you can set. And what you also have to do is you have to untick this here, use frame format settings. Otherwise you can't change that here. You see if I try to type something in, it goes back. So you have to untick that. And what you also can do is a mask is normally an 8-bit integer. So you have an 8-bit channel here. It's only black and white. And in nearly most cases, this is absolutely enough. But sometimes you want a little bit more bit depth inside of a mask. And what you can do here under depth, you really can change here the depth to, for example, to float 16 or even float 32. So this is possible if you really need that. In our case, let's go here back to default, kill this mask again and use this nice keyboard shortcut here to click here and get our mask now here in. And I open it here in the second viewer because now we want to talk a little bit about how a mask is attached here. So we see that this here is a black and white image and if you come from other applications, this is really clear. If you have a mask, a black and white image in alpha, White means one, it's selected. Black means zero, it's not selected. A really easy concept. The same is here. And if you now take a look here into this node here, where we use this mask, we can go here to the settings. And you see that at the moment we have two settings here for this mask. We have here apply mask inverted. Okay, this inverts the information. So black and white is then swapped here. And we also can multiply by a mask. And this is a really interesting option. Why? At the moment, this mask here limits where the brightness and contrast works on this image. But sometimes you want to stencil out a plate. And if you want to stencil something out, we talked about that in one of our previous lessons. We use here a multiplication by an alpha. And if you want to reverse that, you use an alpha divide. And we name this process a pre-multiplication. And you can do that directly here if you want. If you say, okay, I want to use brightness and contrast and I also want to pre mult it by this alpha, you can go here and say multiply by mask. And you see this here is now the result. And 
This setting here is not only in the brightness and contrast, you will find it also in other nodes. For example, let's say we have a merge node here, only to demonstrate that. And let's drop it in here. And we also have a mask here, which means that if you bring a foreground into that here, we can mask this. Let's try this directly here. Let's take a, another image here. So this nice yellow car and bring it here in. Now you see that this car here is occluding now the data stream which we have underneath that. And now we can mask this out here by the same ellipse. And now you see something like that here. And if you now say, okay, I don't need any background because the background was garbage. You don't want to use it at all. Let's select the merge node, go to the settings and say, I want to multiply by the mask. And this is sometimes useful. Not always because you don't see it from the outside so good. So on alpha multiply here is maybe the better solution. But if you need that, it's a good thing. There are sometimes other options here. You will see that a little bit later. So be aware that under settings, we talk with the node how they use the alpha. So let's bring these nodes out here and go back here to our example, which we want to do here. Let's talk now about the settings which we have inside of a mask. This here is an ellipse mask. So it's a special generator. We talk about the different kind of masks in a moment. And this ellipse mask always generates circles. And we have some control about these circles here in this area here. But before we talk about these here, which are position and width and height and angle of this circle, we talk about these here because these are common options for all the masking tools. So the first option here is show view controls. And you see, if you have a mask selected, so you have here this little widget in the middle where we can position it, which means then the center here. So where the mask is, and you remember this is not in pixel, this is in percentage. And by the way, if you want to reset the value, make a double click here on the word center here. This brings everything back. Then we have here this circle, which doesn't make too much sense at the moment because it's the angle. So we can rotate the mask and that's it. So most masks can be positioned like that. But sometimes you don't want to see this widget. And for getting rid of that, we can tick that here or you select another node. But sometimes you still want to work here, so you can deactivate that. Then we have a level, which is like opacity of a mask. And we will see how masks are sequentially stacked together in a moment. So this is also useful for that. But you see, you also can use it here in our example. Then we have a filter here how this mask here is filtered. And really cool, we have a soft edge. So for our vignette, we need a soft edge. So let's go here. You see, we have a slider, we can go up and down. And if the slider is at the end, but you need more, you can go over this field here and type something in, for example, and you see it's still working. And then the slider is much, much longer and you can work with that here. So it's possible to overdo it. Then. For a vignette, we need an inversion. We know we can do it in the brightness and contrast, but I want to do it here. So go here, say invert, and then we can do it here directly. So this is also possible. And then we also have a really interesting option, which is a bother width. For this, I remove the soft edge for a moment, and we see we have a really sharp outside here. Let's go out of the inversion for a moment. And we can move now this border in and out. And this is something which you can use for motion graphics, for example, for animations. So everything here which has a dot is animatable. So you see a really flexible system. And what you also can do with this, let's reset the border width for a moment. We can say we don't need a solid circle. We want to have a border. And if you tick this here, suddenly we have a little bit more options here. And we don't see anything. Why? Because we have now a border width of zero. And we can go now to the outside here to make a bigger border here. So now we have a nice circle. And we have some more interesting features here, like for example, the length and the position. And like I've said, we use mask a lot inside of Fusion for motion graphics. So this is a tool set for that. So let's 
bring everything back how we need it. So we need it inverted, we need it solid, we don't need a border, and we need a little bit of a soft edge. And then we can use here width and height. And for this, we have here this circle. And you see that this view control here has some more options. We have in the different directions here, so north, east, south, and west, we have uh, handles. And if you click them, you can now shape this circle here. And what we also have is here in the half directions, we have options here for proportional changes. Now you have seen everything which is here and we have built our first really simple vignette. Then we talked a little bit about these image settings, so really fast, only the output size and how it clips. So the clipping can be interesting. Here you see the difference, so where this mask stops. That's the idea behind that. Okay, now we've talked about the common settings in a mask, how you use them and which port we use them. And by the way, masking for effects is something which we use all the time, but there are some interesting things you can do in Fusion with the help of the mask. For example, you see here in the media in where the image is loaded, we also have a mask input. Same for the loader. So if you have a loader node, which you use normally in a Fusion Studio or even here, you can use it, we can mask that. So if I now bring this here in, you see that directly while you're loading, you mask it out. So you stencil it out. And for this, we would then go here and remove the invert. And then you see, you do it like that here. So can be useful sometimes. That's nice. Okay, now let's look over the other so named shape based masks. So the ellipse here makes everything which is a circle. Then we have here a rectangular mask. So let's flick it in here and only look here to this mask like this here. And you see the common controls are absolutely the same like I've said. So this is really easy. But here for this rectangle, we can change the height and the width here. But we also have a corner radius if you want something like that here. It's really cool. And remember also solid yes, no border width and all these cool stuff. So you can build your fake UI with something like that. So these are these two generators. And then we have here these two guys here. The first one I want to show you here is the polygon mask or the Bezier mask. And this is our workhorse for rotoscoping. Yeah, so these two are used a lot in rotoscoping and I will make a special lesson about all these tools here, how they work and why they work like they do. But let's get started. Uh, by the way, I bring my tick here a little bit to the side and now you see that in the moment I added the polygon mask, my time indicator was sitting here and now you see we have a keyframe here. And this is a really, really annoying thing for beginners inside of Fusion. We will look in that at the moment. So keep in mind at the moment we added our polygon tool to our flow, the time indicator in the timeline get a keyframe for this mask. And let's draw now something. I can click here for making edge points or I can drag here for making smooth points. So as in many other uh, vector applications, the same tools. If you have finished it, closed it, you can now take here the points and change them here. You see we have tangents here. We can smooth them with Shift S out here to get a tangent which goes through. Or you can make a corner point with Shift L. But like I've said, I will make my own lesson here with you about that. And now we have this shape here. And now we come back here to the interesting thing with the keyframe. Sometimes now you are drawing something to stencil something else. For example, you want to stencil out here this media in something like that here. Let's go here and say we want to have here that and here that. And then suddenly you want to make an adjustment. But 
by accident, you have moved your time indicator somewhere else. If you do that now here, you will run into an interesting problem. Why? Because in the moment you've done that, you see we have our first animation. So the polygon mask and also here the B spline mask are prepared for rotoscoping and animation of the shape directly out of the box. And the reason for this is here. You see that here is a keyframe set automatically. So let's redo that so that you see it. I'm in frame zero. I add now my Bezier mask here and you see the keyframe here is set. We are in an auto key mode directly. And if we now start, let's say I want to do some clicks here on my image. Okay, and I use that now here for stenciling this out. You have keyed this shape here. If you now go to the next frame, the auto key is working. To get rid now of this functionality, you can do one of two things. One thing would be, let's do the accident. I go to another frame and I say, I want to move this guy a little bit over here. Now we have our animation, like I've said, here it is. What you can do is go over the frame where you did the accident and remove the keyframe here and then jump back to the last keyframe but then you lose all your work. So a better workflow would be, before you do anything, if you know that you need a static mask, go here, go to the keyframe guy, make a right mouse button click and say, remove the polygon one polyline, which means remove the animation curve for this polyline. That's it. And now you never get a new keyframe at all here. You see, now you can work without any problems here and you don't get keyframes and you can work on every point inside of this here. These shape animation options are not available inside of the rectangular mask or the ellipse mask, or there's another shape mask, which is the triangle mask. So if I drag it in here, you get a triangle here and you don't have them here because these are shape generators and the shapes are always keyed here by the shape options, not the shape of the points. So you don't see any control vertices in these three here. That's the background for this. Okay, the polygon, I think it's clear. More information about how all these tools work in the polygon and the B spline later in another lesson. Let's drag it out here and take another friend here, which is the B spline. And B spline also uses your clicks for setting control vertices, but the B spline is something which looks like a NURBS curve. So you click here, you click here, we have two control vertices and a red line, which is not the final result. You make the third click and now you see these here, the yellow ones are the hull and the final result is now this here. So you see, every time you set it control vertices here, you get this line here between them. And I can close the whole thing. And you see, this is really organic. It's really cool for rotoscoping out organic shapes. Really nice. But the problem is, you see, it's not so controllable for hard edge objects. What you can do to make this here a little bit sharper is you can set more control points. So it's quite easy here in this tool. It is named Insert Modify. So if you click here, you get another point. If you click here, you get another point. Now you see it's sharper, but not perfect sharp. So Let's get rid of the point, select them and use the backspace key here. And what you also can do is you can select the point here and change the weight. And weight, W key is the keyboard shortcut. You hold down the W key, go over a point and then you drag over the point. And so you can change the weight here. But this here is meant for more organic shapes. So that's the reason why it works like this here. Okay, now you have seen the basic mask tools and Let's make a little bit housekeeping here. And let's talk about how you can combine masks with each other. For this, we take our image here and we want, for example, to mask out this roof piece here. 
So if you want to do something like that, you can do it in one go, which is sometimes a little bit complicated, or what you can do is you can make it in steps. Let's take, for example, a polygon tool here. And you see, I can mask out here without hooking it up. And the reason for this is it's resolution independent. We talked about that, so it's quite easy to work like that. And now we can go in here. We want to make corner points. So what I do now is I click here, I click here, I click here, and I click here. And now I close the whole thing. And remember, this is key. So make a right mouse button, click here, right click for shape animation and remove the polyline only to make sure that I never get the problem that I move my time indicator and I get a new keyframe. And now we have our first mask. And what we now can do is we can take another of these polygon masks here. This time we remove the polygon directly. And we say, I want to go here and say, I want to have this area here. And you see, I make a little bit of an overlap. We can correct this later if we like. Okay. And now we have two masks. And if we now drag them here into the second viewer, you see how these masks look here. And to combine now these masks together, inside of Fusion, we use the mask input here of the masks themselves. So instead of using a mask like this here, this here was the effect mask where we say limit the effect of this here. This here is different. If you hook up masks to each other, they combine automatically. So they make a combination of their influence. And that's the way we normally work. So we can have a full stack of these nodes and build a really complex mask out of that without having everything somewhere hidden inside of one node. This is a really good time saver. And if you now want to say how this combination works at the moment, you see, let's get rid here of our view controls. You see, they combine, they plus each other. But if you have the second mask selected, and this is important. In the first mask, you see, we don't have this option. We only have it in the second mask. You see here that we have now a paint mode. And this paint mode is set to merge, which means everything which comes in is merged together. But then we have here mathematical operations. We can add them, we can subtract them, we can average them out, we can also replace and copy them and things like that. So this is the idea how we can combine them. That means, for example, let's go in here and say we want to have another mask. And let's take this time a rectangle and say, I want not to have this area here. So let's take the rectangle here and say, we don't need this area here. Okay. We hook the whole thing up, bring this in to this side and this here to this side. Now you see how it looks. At the moment they merge together. So they are plussed together. But now we can go here and say, I want to subtract this area here. And now we have a more complex mask here for working with it. At the end, sometimes you have a really long stack of these mask nodes. What you can do is you can make a little bit of housekeeping. One thing would be, you see, normally I want to see the masks here. So there's an option on the flow base and also node base. If you click only in the flow, right mouse button click, you see here you can tell now what you want to see as preview or tile pictures. I deactivated force all tile pictures because this is a waste of performance. You see everything gets here, a logo or a tile picture. You can have them for all the sources. So this means also media in loaders and so have them. But in my case, I have deactivated them, but for the mass, I normally want to see the tile picture. So this is one way of doing it, but this is for the whole flow. If you only want to do it on a mask base, what you can do is you select the mask, which you don't need to see anymore. Yeah, so for example, these two, make a right mouse button click and here under show, you have your show tile pictures. And this is something you can change. Be aware that this here, 
is a global setting which overrides whole thing so we can get rid of that and say I don't want to see this here I don't want to see this here um, so this is something you can do if you want but if you have the global setting here on you see you override that another thing which you can do and this is sometimes quite useful you select all of these make a right mouse button click here and then you go to group or you use Control G and then you get a group here which you then can use here directly as one node in your flow. So this is one way. And if you want to expand the group or ungroup it completely, you have here the options or the keyboard shortcut. So ungroup it and you see it looks then like this. If you have these grouped, Control G, you see you get something like this, which looks much, much nicer. You can double click it, go inside of that, look around here, how it works, and then you can also close then the group again. So this is then for complex mask setups. We are nearly through and we talked about these shape-based masks. So these four and also the other ones which are here in the mask section. But there are some more masks here which you maybe don't find directly. So let's talk about these quite briefly. We have a mask paint here now. We have a bitmap. We have a range. And we have the magic wand here. Okay, let's talk about these here. I take here my media in, bring it to the side, and let's say we want to use the bitmap here, for example. Okay, what is the bitmap doing? The bitmap mask makes a conversion. And this is an interesting concept. We talked about in the beginning of this lesson that the mask is an integer 8 data stream. So it's a black and white image. But sometimes you have images from external data, for example, or from your flow, which are bitmaps, and you want to use them as a mask. It is possible to do something like that, but you see it's a little bit more complicated. Let's make an example of that instead of only explaining something which you don't see. Let's take back here our vignette. And let's go to the media pool and I have here a cloud image. It looks like that here. You see, it's a color image, no alpha channel, it's a PNG. And we have here blue cloud on white background. And if you now want to use this here as a mask, look what happens. You can hook it up and you see some things are now happening. In the middle of our image, suddenly we have this grayish box. The reason for this is the size. You remember, this is 4K, this is 1K, so it's much, much smaller what you see here. This is one thing which you have to keep in mind, but we don't see the cloud or something like that. And the reason for this is that this here is not a ready prepared mask, but it uses it as mask. You see it with a blue line here. So let's go back to our brightness and contrast node and go back to the settings we were there before. And I showed you these two options, apply mask inverted and multiply by mask. Now suddenly, because we used the bitmap, we have more options. You see here a fit mask. So this is the problem of the sizes of these two images. They don't fit together. We can go here to width, for example, and now you see, oh, now the element is the same size as the 4K plate. So you can resize directly here, the mask. This is done here. You can play with these options. But the another thing, and I bring it back so that you directly can see what happens is, you tell the system which information you want to use from this image here, because it's not a mask, it's an image. And it uses normally the alpha channel. And we have no alpha channel in this image here. So everything is white, and so you see directly the output here. Here is the white alpha channel of this here. But what you can do is you can go into other options. For example, we can say, show me where the blue content is. And I think we have a little bit of blue in the cloud. And now you see, if you do that and you go quite close, you maybe see a little bit of influence, but not very much. So what I do now here is something different. I go here to luminance, for example, and now you see the cloud is better because the cloud is darker than the outside. And then we have here these sliders. This here is really complicated. And I don't want to use it like this. So 
Let's get rid of that. And instead of that, use a bitmap mask. And the bitmap mask does exactly that what I have shown you. You take a bitmap information and you plug it into the background of the bitmap mask. And now I flick it in here. And you see the same result as before. Everything is white now because this is now the resulting mask you get. And now you see that the bitmap node has the same options which we have seen and some more of them. And that's the cool thing. Now we say, I don't want to use the alpha, I want to use the luminance. Here we go. Now we can use these sliders here to make a really nice cloud shape here. Then we also can invert the whole thing if we like. And now you see, if we use that now in brightness and contrast, you see it works. We directly see here now our cloud shape. Yeah, and we can play with that. Still the size problem is there, but what we also can do is we can soft edge the whole thing here. This is possible, you see. And what we also can do is we can change the file input to width so that we have now the same size here. So you, now you see we have a nice cloud shape here with the right width and we can soften it out here and have them a bitmap now used as a mask. Okay, then we have ranges. So if you look into the range, we also have here an input. So let's flick it in here. You see, you select again something here, which is in a color range, shadow, midtones, highlights. You can select again what you want to see here. So it's like a way of keying, but the result then is a mask. Then we have the magic wand. So we also need the color information. And inside of the magic wand, we have a little picker here. And you see, depending where, let's bring here the cloud so that you see it better. Depending where now here the picker sits, you get a selection here. We can change the color space, the range, the soft edge, and all these kind of stuff. And the output then here is a mask again. You see? Same as before. And the last one is a mask paint. So the mask paint is really straightforward. You have painting tools here again and you also see them here and you can directly paint here a mask. Uh, you can paint here with um, pixel information and also with vector information. So I hope this was useful. You understand a little bit how now these different mask nodes work. Most of the time I work in these vector-based mask tools for rotoscoping and motion graphics, but you have seen some specialties here. If you have any questions, please write them down in the comments below. There will be coming a lesson about rotoscoping and how to use all the tools inside of these masks a little bit later. And if you like this kind of content, please subscribe, give me a thumbs up. And if you want to support me further, you can find my Patreon where we can talk even more. And you also can get more files and ad-free tutorials on my Patreon. So have a nice day, have fun, see you next time, Helga Maus.